Good afternoon and welcome to Evans Hall here at the Yale School of Management. My name is Brian Garcia. I'm president and CEO of the Connecticut Green Bank. I'm joined today by Jeff Shubb, the executive director of the Coalition for Green Capital. This roundtable is being broadcast live to hundreds of people across the country and throughout the world. So welcome to our online audience with us here today. Before we get started, we wanted to acknowledge the people in this room and those out there listening who have been steadfast and courageous in advancing the Green Bank movement. It begins with Governor Malloy and his team, who put forth the policy concept of creating the nation's first state-level Green Bank in the country in the 2011 legislative session here in Connecticut. Liz Donahue, Chris Smith, Paul Mounds, Dan DeSimone, and the rest of the governor's team, thank you for your leadership. It continues with the bipartisan support of the Connecticut General Assembly, who unanimously passed Public Act 1180 in June of 2011, and who have been incredible supporters of the Connecticut Green Bank ever since. Representative Lonnie Reed, who's with us here today, Tim Ackert, Laura Hoydick, Senators Bob Duff, Paul Doyle, Paul Formica, and the rest of the Energy and Technology Committee, thank you for your support. Transforming a public policy vision into action requires leadership at the governance level. And the board of directors of the Connecticut Green Bank is like no other in this country. They have the responsibility of translating public policy into practice. DECD Commissioner Catherine Smith, Deep Commissioner, former Deep Commissioner Dan Esty, current Deep Commissioner Rob Klee, Norma Glover, John Herity, Matt Rinelli, Reed Hunt, and the rest of the Board of Directors of the Connecticut Green Bank, thank you for making a public policy vision a reality. It goes without saying that public service is a privilege. The Connecticut Green Bank is fortunate to have the best public servants in the state, and in fact, this country. For those of you here who work for the Connecticut Green Bank, please stand. All right, thank you. Thank you all for your service, and uh, our staff is also listening online, so staff, if you're there, take a bow. Thank you for your, for your support and your leadership. Keep doing what you are doing because you are leading a national movement by what you are doing right here in the Constitution State. To our partners who are making clean energy more accessible and affordable to everybody in Connecticut by mobilizing private investment into Connecticut's clean energy economy, a key bank, uh, we're here with Pete Thomas. Uh, Pete, thank you for all of your support. Uh, Webster Bank, U.S. Bank, Bank of America, People's Bank, uh, Brian Levine. Brian Levine's here with us today. Thank you, Brian. Our community banks and credit unions through the Smarty Loan. Hannon Armstrong, Enhanced Capital, Greenworks Lending. Ali Cooley is with us here today. Hey, Ali. Uh, Hampshire Foundation, Tremaine Foundation, MacArthur Foundation, Kresge Foundation. Our utilities, United Illuminating, Eversource Energy, the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, Connecticut Business and Industry Association, REBA, Solar Connecticut, Audubon Connecticut, I saw Stuart Hudson here uh, as well, uh, the Acadia Center, Jamie Howland, I saw Jamie, uh, Environment Connecticut, Chris, uh, Connecticut Fund for the Environment, Clean Water Action, Quantum Biopower, Brian, I saw Brian Pagnini uh, and Ron earlier as well, and of course the Coalition for Green Capital. It indeed takes a village to make this all work. Thank you all for, part, for being partners with the Connecticut Green Bank. And lastly, to Yale University and the Center for Business and the Environment, who have been an incredible partner throughout this journey. The research, education, and outreach that you are doing is indeed tackling one of the central management challenges of the 21st century, our transition to a sustainable economy. And with that, Welcome in those acknowledgments. Let's introduce our distinguished guests this afternoon, Senator Chris Murphy and Senator Richard Blumenthal. Senator Richard Blumenthal has been a strong voice in the Senate for Connecticut citizens, fighting for our health, our workers, our families, and our veterans. As the ranking member of the Committee on Veterans Affairs, Senator Blumenthal has dedicated his career to honoring and caring for veterans of all eras and using his position on the committee to fight for Connecticut veterans and their families. As a member of the Commerce, Science, and Transportation Committee, which includes not only science and technology research, 
that plays a pivotal role in American business, but also includes transportation infrastructure, maritime security, and environmental protection. Senator Blumenthal has an extensive history advocating for domestic and international commerce. Senator Murphy has been a strong voice in the Senate fighting for job creation, affordable health care, education, sensible gun laws, and a forward-looking foreign policy. As a member of the Senate Appropriations Committee, Senator Murphy has fought to increase investments in Connecticut manufacturing and promote procurement of world-class national defense products made in Connecticut. As a member of the Foreign Relations Committee, he has been an outspoken proponent of diplomacy, international human rights, and the need for American leadership abroad. Welcome, Senators. To get us going this afternoon, uh, can the both of you talk about the U.S. Green Bank Act proposal in the Senate? What is it? Why is it important? What will it do for America? Why don't we begin with uh, Senator Murphy? Great. Uh, well, listen, thank you very much, uh, Brian. Thank you, Jeff, for joining us uh, and August roundtable here. We've got limited time, so I think we'll make our remarks very brief and then allow this uh, discussion to uh, be really uh, mostly on your terms. But we're both really uh, thrilled to be here, in particular, uh, excited to be here with both uh, James Albus and Lonnie Reed. There's a great story to tell here in Connecticut about uh, the nation's most successful Green Bank, the nation's first Green Bank, but these are tough times in Hartford, and uh, that success uh, has been under threat just because people are looking for all sorts of places to try to save money. And it was Lonnie and, and James and a handful of others that really protected the investment that was seeded into the Green Bank. Um, and I think that is important for the projects that will be funded here in Connecticut, but frankly, um, the protection of our Green Bank here. Um, and the funding in it, the capitalization of it, um, is also really important because other states are looking to Connecticut as a model. The Federal Green Bank is ultimately going to look to Connecticut as a model. And so uh, the, the, the more we protect our success, the more chance we have to replicate it. Um, I, I was really excited to reintroduce uh, as the lead sponsor of the Federal Green Bank legislation. Senator Blumenthal has been a partner in all of this. Um, Chris Van Holland, who is currently a member of the House, uh, has introduced the companion legislation. He's soon going to be a United States senator, so we're going to have to replace him with a new lead sponsor in the House of Representatives. But uh, this is really picking up steam at the federal level, and I don't need to go into the details of it, but uh, what we are proposing to do is essentially replicate on scale what has happened here in Connecticut. Our proposal is for a green, back, a green bank that is initially capitalized by Treasury at $10 billion, with a total capitalization ultimately of up to $50 billion. It would not hold loans itself, but it would uh, partner with either state-based green banks uh, or uh, private lending institutions to, to feed money uh, to them to do a variety of financing that is not unfamiliar to the Connecticut Green Bank. We're talking about, you know, uh, loans, loan guarantees, debt securitization, insurance, other forms of risk management and mitigation the legislation, you know, would essentially just charter this institution, um, give it some basic parameters, require some cost sharing on behalf of its participants, um, list out the eligible institutions and the broad parameters of the project that we want to finance, which would essentially mirror what you financed here, and uh, and 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 then let the um, you know the, the management of it and the risk decisions be made by the institution itself. Um, and, and we know that this is the perfect moment to scale up a federal green bank. Um, the numbers are. You know, pretty remarkable. Um, what we've seen just from 2014 to 2015 in terms of investment in green energy, we've seen an overall 18 percent increase. But on the private sector side, we've seen a 26 percent increase. So you just look at 14 to 15 in the amount of private financing that's going into green energy projects. And just look at the first quarter of this year with respect to the, um, to, 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 to the scope of new power generation, you can see what that's resulted in. So new power generation first quarter of this year um, is 64% uh, solar and 33% wind. 
you total that up and you understand that right now we are putting renewables online as new power generation. We're not putting much uh, coal or, or oil or even gas online. Um, that's where the money is heading. And it's resulted in, within just one year, total generation from renewables in this country jumping from 14% to 17%. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot, but it is. In one year, to see a 3% jump in the overall share um, of renewables is pretty remarkable. So we see um, this market moving really fast, and it's going to move even faster with the ratification of the Paris Agreement. So the Paris Agreement is predicated um, it's certainly predicated upon each country making specific policy choices that will get us to the overall goals of, um, of temperature increase. Um, but it really is predicated upon those policy choices um, being done all at one time, providing an enormous, enormous incentive for private capital. And this Green Bank seeks to make the landing for that private capital just a little bit softer, um, right? The goal of this Green Bank is to use the smallest amount of public subsidy um, uh, that is possible to leverage the largest amount of private investment. Um, and so uh, we really think this is the perfect time to put this in place because there is going to be a lot of private capital that's going to seek to capitalize on the opportunities presented by the Paris Accords, but might need a little bit of insurance, a little bit of risk mitigation, a little bit of loan guarantee in order to get to the finish line. Uh, so um, we're really proud to have introduced this legislation, uh, and we think that there may be a political moment upcoming in which we can get it done, and I'll just leave you with this. Um, you obviously know what my preference is in terms of the, who wins this presidential campaign. Uh, but uh, but um, if you try to imagine what the next president is going to spend their sort of initial political capital on, it, it looks like an infrastructure investment is the most likely target no matter who occupies the White House. Um, now, you know, Donald Trump has put sort of no specifics on any of his plans, but Hillary Clinton has. She's sort of outlined a plan to put about $250 billion into infrastructure. Um, and I would think that if you're talking about a major play on infrastructure, that this would be part of that conversation. $10 billion is a lot of money, a lot of money but if you're asking for um, you know, just a small percentage of a much bigger infrastructure play to be spent on green infrastructure uh, it seems to be a pretty compelling argument. Um, so we can talk about all the ways in which that money sort of shows up at the door for an infrastructure play, but th the moment may come quicker than we might think. We might be talking about this in early 2017. So uh, really excited to be here, really excited to do this along with Senator uh, Blumenthal, we sort of occupy the Commerce Committee, which uh, Senator Blumenthal is on, which does a lot of this policy. I'm on the Appropriations Committee, which does uh, all the financing, and, and hopefully between the two of us, uh, along with Sheldon Whitehouse, who's our other co-sponsor, we can uh, put this on the agenda for early next year. Thank you. Uh, first, thanks to Chris Murphy for his leadership. Uh, I'm very excited to be helping to lead this effort in the United States Senate from the Commerce Committee, but also all the other committees that I'm on, because this is an idea that really cuts across different committees in the United States Congress. I'm on the Judiciary Committee, which will have responsibility for some of the antitrust and consumer protection issues that are involved here. The Armed Services Committee, our military will benefit from these investments, as well as the Veterans Affairs Committee, and if there's any selling point that I think is critical to get this across the finish line, it is jobs. Jobs for veterans, jobs in every community, jobs to install solar on the rooftops of shopping centers or new heating systems in homes or across the board. I don't need to tell this group how investment will spur job creation and economic growth, and that has to be the priority for a new administration for all kinds of reasons. First, because environmentally, we have that moral responsibility. But secondly, to bring this country together, economic growth and job creation really have to be the priority. And this kind of green bank, investment bank, 
can be a critical tool in that process. And that's why I think it will be bipartisan. I'm very hopeful that uh, folks from both sides of the aisle will join in this effort. As you know, uh, the idea of an infrastructure bank it has been around for a while. In fact, I have worked to build a bipartisan coalition behind a general infrastructure bank. Uh, Senator Blunt and I, he's a Republican from Missouri, have a proposal that's before the Commerce Committee. Senator Warner, Senator Bennett, this, this idea of using a public-private partnership is one that, whose idea it, it has come. Uh, it also brings together, let me say very importantly, the business community and the labor community. And I'm happy that we've been joined by John Harrity, who is the president of the State Council of Machinists. And I thank you for being here, John. Uh, Lonnie and Jim have been great in the state legislature in putting together the multidisciplinary, multi-party, bipartisan approach that we th I think we need to replicate politically. So it, it is an idea whose time has come, plus, and you guys know this, I know I'm telling you something you already know, there's just a lot of capital chasing opportunities. There is a lot of money sloshing around the system looking for good investment. It's true in this country, but it's also true worldwide, and it's true of American corporations who've parked profits overseas, the profits that haven't been repatriated, and part of the concept for the infrastructure bank that I propose is to bring those profits back. And there again, the partnership element is so important. Politically, it will still be a lift. And I'll tell you why. <laughs> because we will come back to a Washington that continues to have a right wing, I'm not gonna get partisan here, but there are in Go effect ahead. opponents. <laughs> uh, Chris would be much blunter than I. Um, who simply don't believe in the public sector doing anything constructive. I think that's the best way to put it. And it still mystifies me why they want to be in public office, because essentially they want to block everything that is constructive that government can do. But we will need support. In other words, this is not kind of a layup or a no-brainer that you can assume will just slide through. And uh, I think there's a very exciting opportunity ahead to seize this moment and make sure that we do not miss this opportunity. And I think, just to, to um, finish, and then uh, I apologize that we've gone on as long as we have, uh, I do think that there, there is a moment here, seems perfect, but if we lose it, it won't come around again quickly, because that political capital that Chris mentioned will be used on other things. And there are lots of things to use political capital on, the healthcare system, other infrastructure programs, a variety of different kinds of needs and challenges that the country faces, not the least of which is our national security and our defense. But we can do those things, and we can do this. And I think that as long as we press our case with the intelligence and integrity that you folks bring to the table, and I thank you for, for all of your great work, uh, we can make this idea a winner that crosses the aisle, that crosses disciplines, that crosses geography. We have a core group that I think we can expand, and uh, I'm looking forward to the opportunity to do so. Thank you. Great, so gr great opening remarks. Thank you for that. So we are going to take questions from the audience, but we're gonna start off with uh, Jeff uh, from the Coalition for Green Capital, uh, jumping right on in, Jeff. Great, thanks so much, Brian, and thank you uh, for the incredible leadership both of you have shown on, on this topic of green banks. Our nonprofit is working in about 15 states now, um, and I can tell you all of our state partners are incredibly excited about this bill because they see this opportunity to replicate Connecticut's success and are looking for funding. And a lot of them are asking kind of similar questions. Uh, 
that touch on something both of you alluded to, which is a broader infrastructure conversation. Uh, both candidates support infrastructure investment. Uh, Hillary Clinton was in Bridgeport and specifically gave a shout out to the Connecticut Green Bank and said it's built on the principles that she wants her national infrastructure bank to be built on. How do you see the discussion playing out around exactly what the National Infrastructure Bank addresses, what sectors, and how do you see the Green Bank uh, fitting into that discussion and clean energy investment in general fitting into the discussion around national infrastructure investment? Well, I, think, I, I think Dick did a good job of describing what the opportunity is here, but also what the what the challenge is. So, so the opportunity is that, that, that framed the right way, this is a wonderful opportunity for bipartisan compromise, and we just have to look to Connecticut's example. We need to show that, you know, that, that this has been a self-sustaining effort, a, a bank that has been able to um, generate a, a lot of capital, has been able to push forward a lot of projects, and has, um, and has been financially viable. Um, now, there have been some other green banks that have not been as successful, and so we're going to have to sort of tell the story of what works and what doesn't work. But, um, you know, there are a lot of Republicans who, who want to um, who wanna support these public-private partnerships. Um, the downside is that there's just nothing more politically charged today than the issue of climate change. And, listen, I, I, I hate the idea of setting aside the scientific and moral imperative. Um, but, but even if you did, right, you've got all sorts of reasons why, from just an economic perspective, you should be investing in all of this. But anytime you sort of just stick your toe in this conversation about green infrastructure and its impact on climate, you're, you're in a hornet's nest. And so um, I, I think that it's our best chance to make a big down payment um, on our obligation to be part of the global effort to reduce uh, climate pollutants, but it's still a little bit of a third rail. So um, w w the, the, the opportunity is there, like I said, at the beginning of next year. I think, as Dick's talking about, this opportunity to do sort of international tax um, reform, whereby we allow companies to bring back the income that they have held offshore, tax it at a rate that we agree on, and take that money, that sort of one-time big chunk of revenue, and put it in infrastructure probably gets a lot of bipartisan support. The question is, could you get enough Republicans to support taking a piece of that and putting into a green bank? I just, I, I just don't know at this point whether there's whether that that piece would be too controversial. But um, if you're going to get any money put into green infrastructure, it would be through this public-private partnership. Let me just make two points quickly. Um, you know what strikes me as probably the least informed of anyone here about the environmental implications of what we can do in terms of infrastructure is how everything is related to everything else. What we grow, how we grow it, what we eat has environmental implications. How we travel, whether it's by rail or car, what could be more basic? If we invest in rail, there are huge opportunities to create jobs. I keep coming back to jobs, which is the way we can sell this idea, but uh, our rail is in danger of really coming to the standard of a third world country. Uh, Chris and I worked very hard to get money for Amtrak in the latest transportation bill and to provide for more safety measures. There's a system called positive train control, which I've been advocating and championing for many years, which could have prevented the Hoboken, New Jersey disaster. Killed a person, injured a lot, cost in property, commuting time, horrendous. But railroads have resisted it. They say they can't afford it. Green Bank is a way to tell them, look, we're going to provide the money. The money is there at virtually zero cost, and it's on you to do the right thing. An environmental selling point with rail versus travel on roads. Investing in, in renewable energy. We pass tax credits for solar and wind, not yet for fuel cells. Hope we can do that. But again, investing uh, in those kinds of sources is uh, something this, this green, green Bank could do. So I think the interrelationships here are very important, and I think that will be a major selling point. Great. So we're going to open it up now to questions from the audience. If you could just 
name, organization, and, and, and throw the question out there. We're going to start with uh, Ali Cooley from Greenworks. My question is, is very simple, which is, what can we do as private sector participants to help build the bipartisan support in Washington for the passage of the National Green Bank Bill? So, uh, thanks for the for, for the for the question, and um, I, you know, I think there's a there's a number of different answers, but you know, we need the broader business community uh, to be plugged into this conversation, right? So. Uh, listen, I, I, we have to be political here, so the reason this is not going to pass is because Republicans uh, aren't going to support it in big enough numbers. So we're talking about speaking to Republicans here. You know, that's the reality of this debate. Um, and so what are the ways to move Republicans? Well, there are a number of groups that are really influential with the Republican Party, like the Chamber of Commerce at the national level, like the National Association of Small Businesses. Um, there's um, a, a number of business organizations, the National Association of Manufacturers, right? We can go down the list of groups that, you know, can get into a senator's or a representative's office pretty quickly on the Republican side. Um, and the, the, the companies that you work with, the many of you work with, who are members of those organizations, or who are influential with those organizations, that's, um, that's an untapped opportunity right now. I mean, this ultimately has to be, you know, not just academics and, um, and environmental advocates. This has to be a priority for, um, for business organizations as well. And that's not easy, but as, as a company that has connections in to the business community here in Connecticut, saying to them, hey, listen, you belong to these national associations. You need to tell them when you go to Washington for their annual conference that this has to be one of uh, their asks. That's a simple way to help. And let me just sort of emphasize that point by picking two words in your question. Great question. Small business. Small businesses create jobs. And small businesses have the ears of politicians in a way that the mega corporations may not. We went through this kind of fight on the Export-Import Bank. Many of the big corporations, exporting companies, were all in favor of the Export-Import Bank. We had a terrible fight getting it done, and uh, Senator Murphy and I helped to lead this effort, even though the Chamber of Commerce was on our side, because we needed to muster small businesses around the country. And to the extent that you can galvanize and mobilize that group, that's very important. And, and rightly, because small businesses not only provide the jobs, but they also do a lot of the innovating and inventing. And so it's a kind of wellspring of economic growth and capitalism uh, that I think is very important. Questions? So I think uh, here um, you have to push the button for the mic uh, if you have questions. So who's got a question? Don't have me go to the Socratic method. We're here at uh, School of Management. and I know what that is because I went to law school there here. You go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> here and then we'll come to you. Oh, perfect. So uh, my question is relating to how this green bank at the federal level will look like because there's a com uh, there's an infrastructure bank proposal and then you mentioned how the uh, the import export bank was challenged and ultimately shut down. Uh, how do you ensure this bank will not be continually challenged? Because the very act of this bank is green. It's about renewable energy, which has a lot of resistance. 
So do you imagine it as part of an infrastructure bank, so it's not just about green bank? Uh, well, listen, there, there's, as Dick referenced, you know, there, there's a cadre of, of representatives and senators who, um, I, know, I mean, they're kind of neo-anarchists, right? They don't want the federal government to be involved in anything, right? So their opposition to the Import-Export Bank was not that it was badly run, right? It makes a lot of money for the federal government. It was simply that they don't think there's, they essentially think that the private market can solve every problem, right? Um, that, that, the, that, that private capital will always flow to the most efficient, best projects. There's no role for the federal, for the, for the government to play. Um, and so um, I don't think we're ever going to overcome those objections. Um, uh, but um, but I do think it'll be important to address some of the some of the legitimate concerns that were raised about the import export bank. I mean, they they do have a lot of small business partners, but when you look at the overall size of their portfolio, you know the the, the lion's share of their money does go to the big companies like Boeing. And so I think from the outset, this bank would be smart to make sure that through one way or another. You know, perhaps you know, working with with companies like yours that have lots of small business partners, that the portfolio is is diverse and it's flowing not just to a handful of big institutions, but to uh, ultimately a lot of a lot of smaller beneficiaries. So, um, I, again, I don't think we'll ever address some of the concerns that led to the temporary collapse of the import export bank, but but having a, a more diverse small business focus probably helps. And to, and, and it will be challenged, but part of the case that we need to make is that the beneficiaries are not only the recipients of the loans, but also the countless other companies that are suppliers or components makers or lunch providers. This is the lesson and story of our defense industry in Connecticut. And when we were making the case for the Export-Import Bank, we went to small businesses who had contracts with the GEs and the UTCs of Connecticut. And they were saying, you know, you don't authorize, reauthorize the Export-Import Bank. They're going to be hurt, but they're not going to be buying stuff from us. And these guys you see on our assembly lines are not going to have jobs. So it's, I think it is a story that we need to tell as persuasively as possible, not only about the big guys, but about the small businesses, because they, they get it, they understand, and I think they can be allies. Those indirect and induced job numbers are really, really good yeah. through, for, through clean energy. So uh, name? Yes. Well, Luis Bermudez, um, the communications director for the Button Etiquette. Oh, sorry. Luis Bermudez. The Connecticut League of Conservation Boarders. And um, first, thank you so much for the work that both of you do. But um, my question is directed to going back to something that um, Senator um, Murphy, you were mentioning, which is what are the ways of moving Republican? And of course, it's of no surprise that we live in a fossil fuel economy. And so when we, when we talk about that and those realities, um, there's a lot of resistance, and, and that resistance is out of fear, right? And so um, when we were meeting at the Connecticut League of Conservation Voters with some of our politicians, folks who are looking for endorsements. And some of them from the Republican side said that they had didn't have sufficient information on climate change, on whether or not it was real or not. Um, and so what are ways, what are additional ways that we can have real conversations so that that fear can translate into uh, opportunities, as, as you both mentioned, real opportunities to move green bank? Well, you know, I, I think I, I just point to those first quarter new power generation numbers, right? I mean, the market has decided, right, the winners and losers here. You know, we're not building any more coal plants. You know, maybe we're going to build some more gas plants. We're not probably not building any more oil plants either. And so I think you sort of have to you make the argument to Republicans that, yes, transitions are hard, right? I mean, the transitions are, are hard in, in whatever. Um, industry they occur in. It was hard to move from the horse and buggy industry to the auto industry, but we made the transition and we ended up employing a lot more people in the new industries than we did in the old industries. And so moving from coal and oil to wind and solar, that's hard too. But ultimately, given the ability to export 
this technology. Um, it has the potential to be a huge net winner for the economy. Um, so I, I just, I, I, th I think you have to make the case that we're not in the, in the middle. The, 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 this, tr this transition is happening, <laughs> whether you want it to happen or not. And it's just a question as to whether the United States is going to capture all of the jobs in these new industries or some other country is going to capture them, right? It should scare us to death that one out of the top 10 wind companies are in this country, one out of the top 10 solar companies, and two out of the top 10 advanced battery companies are in the United States, right? That should scare us to death. And, we're, and somebody's going to have all these jobs. It might as well be us. And so, you know, if you watch the vice presidential debate last night, how many times did Mike Pence talk about the war on coal, right? Well, like, you know, as if we're still fighting that battle, we're not, right? We're not building coal plants. We're going to be building these this new capacity, somebody's going to be building this new capacity. It might as well be us. And I, I don't think that's very much the upside and all of that is correct. But I think we need to be mindful that there are people who are going to need help, whether it's in coal country or elsewhere, uh, just as many parts of the country that used to grow a lot more tobacco, and I was involved in the so-called tobacco wars. I sued the tobacco companies. We won a lot of reforms, as well as money, from the tobacco companies. And there's less tobacco production now in the United States than before. And the challenge then was to provide good jobs to those working men and women who were going to be displaced. We can't simply ignore that there will be working men and women who need the benefit of investment in those areas. And that is a way to undercut some of the political opposition. We're not going to convince some of our colleagues who say that human beings have nothing to do with climate change, as long as their constituencies are so negatively impacted. They have a responsibility to represent those folks. But I think we have a better chance of convincing them if we show a positive path for those constituencies. And so we can't just, I, I, and I've argued at length with some of our colleagues who are on the other side of this issue environmentally, and there's a point at which we just are not joining the argument, but I think we have a common responsibility to do better. Great point, great question. Right over here. Brian Farnan from the Kennedy Green Bank. Um, and thank you, Senator Blumenthal, for mentioning tobacco, which kind of, I don't know if you guys seen the movie, thank you for, not, for thank you for smoking. But it makes me think of a time when elected officials used to debate the health impact of cigarettes. And now it's kind of patently clear and in some senses silly to have that argument. Um, with you know, uh, climate change and climate science, do you think there will potentially, as you have these discussions within the halls of Congress and the Senate, there will be a time in, say, the next 10 years where such an argument will be seen as patently you know, clear, and it would be silly to argue anything but the human impact on climate change. Yeah, I think uh, we're on the verge, we're on the cusp of exactly that kind of change of mind. You know, remember that the tobacco companies knew that their products caused cancer and heart disease. They deliberately concealed their own scientific research. And only when we sued them and we got discovery of some of their own research did they settle those cases and acknowledge the harmful impacts of their products. And obviously, the ExxonMobil lawsuit that has been brought by a number of attorneys general has the same objective to show the internal studies that the oil industry has done that would also reveal perhaps their own knowledge of the climate change effects of their products. But I think that we are very much uh, at, on the cusp of a such a sound and solid acceptance of the truth about climate change that we will look back, much as we do now, and say, you know, there was a time when tobacco companies actually advertised that doctors said their products 
were safer than some of the other products. There were ads that show doctors in, in their official garb saying, I recommend name the product. And now we would sort of laugh at those products. I think we're we're on the verge of that kind of public realization. And, and I think if you just look at the demographics here, right, young people have made up their mind, right? This is no controversy amongst people who are in their 20s and 30s. And just like um, young people who got older ultimately uh, won the debate over things like gay marriage, the same thing will happen here. You just have a younger demographic that, that knows the score here and ultimately will win out. And I also think, you know, technology is going to be a big part of this story, right? We're, we're hyper obsessive now about sort of tracking ourselves, right? So everybody's got, you know, Fitbits, everybody sees how much they move and where they go. And um, that's going to, we're going to have that ability when it comes to our carbon footprint, when it comes to the amount of pollution that, you know, we are responsible for. We're going to be able to, you know, interact with the, you know, solar panels on our, I mean, we already can, but you're going to be able to do it in a much more intimate way with the, um, with the solar panels on your car or your hybrid vehicle. Um, so I think as, as more people sort of get into this habit of sort of tracking every bit of their lives, they're going to be much more conscious of the decisions that they're making and the ways in which they can interact with a lot of the resources that you'll make available to them, right? I mean, this is all ultimately about empowering individual people to make the choice themselves. You no longer have to rely on your power distribution company to decide for you what kind of power ends up coming to your home. You can make those decisions and these creative financing vehicles that are now only available to a handful of people because not everybody has the green bank able to uh, do a deal in which you know you amortize out the benefit of the tax credit so that you can get it immediately. The, the federal green bank now will make those kind of creative financing vehicles available to a lot more people so that they can make the decision on their own about the sort of their green future rather than relying on a policymaker or a Duke Power executive to, uh, to make it on their behalf. Question in the back. Yes, yes thank you. You've got the button. I got green. Okay, we're good. Thank you, Senator Murphy and Senator Blumenthal, for coming today. My name is Brian Paganini, and I'm the Vice President of Quantum Biopower. Quantum is on the verge of commissioning one of the East Coast's first food waste energy projects, where we're going to recycle 40,000 tons of food waste, create roughly 1.2 megawatts of power, uh, produce about 10,000 tons a year of a usable soil amendment from our process, and displace roughly 5,000 tons of CO2 on a yearly basis. Um, AD is a natural process and is one of the rare renewable energy technologies that touches both what Representative Albus and Representative Reed do here in the state of Connecticut. Uh, thank you to Brian Garcia for helping us in our capital stack for our project. The Green Bank was able to supplant roughly 20% of the cost of our project through a low interest loan. So without the help of the Green Bank, we would have had to seek out other traditional funding sources towards that. The, and the other partner being People's Bank. People's as well, yes, they're here as well. Yes, yes, thank you, People's. <laughs> um, there's no better way to achieve what you want to achieve on the national level than by bringing folks to see what success looks like. So I would extend the invitation to both of you to bring your colleagues to see what real success through a Green Bank model is here in Connecticut. We're very excited about our project, um, but to ask the question, we found success by utilizing the investment tax credit that's available on, on, on the federal level. Um, for modalities such as solar and wind, that's extended through the year 2023. For things like anaerobic digestion that touch both waste management and energy creation, uh, that tax credit is set to expire in 2019 with the safe harbor expiring at the end of this year. So frankly, for us, uh, if, as we look to develop more projects, which more will come online, the investment tax credit will certainly be an important part of that. So thank you for your time. Can I, can I make one comment and then ask you a question in return? Um, I, listen, I, I'm, I think the Green Bank is going to be a useful tool no matter what sort of overarching renewable energy policy the federal government employs. But I will say this. I don't love the way in which we do this today, which is essentially to use the tax, the, the tax code to pick winners and losers, right? Because we're pretty bad at that, right? And we pick winners and losers based on you know, reasons that have nothing to do with policy. Why did fuel cells get left out and wind and solar get in? I, I can't explain to you that that was based on the merits of the technology. What we should be doing is r helping to set a market. Right? We should be either through a carbon cap or through a carbon tax setting a market and then having vehicles like green banks 
figure out w what fills in underneath. So, uh, you know, I, in an ideal world, we get out of this business of using the tax code to pick winners and losers. Here's my question back to you. If you hadn't had the Green Bank, I think part of our, 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 our trouble is explaining to people why we need it, right? So without the Green Bank financing, would that, would that piece of your stack have not been there, or would you have just had to have paid more for it, thus jeopardizing the project? What, what's, what, what need is this filling? Yeah, I, I think it's a great question. So what is the compelling argument for why we went to the Green Bank? So to answer your question directly, yes. The cost of money outside of the Green Bank would have been more expensive for us. And frankly, you know, there could have been an opportunity where we might not have been able to secure that financing. So yes, so for us, because the capital of our project was, was several millions of dollars, uh, accessing Green Bank funds and having a blended overall lending rate of X, which was much better than going to traditional financing means, yes, it was a compelling argument for us to, to seek those funds. And, so and I agree. You're also borrowing from people. Exactly, that's, that's correct. correct, that's correct. And what is the division, roughly? 80-20. 80-20, yeah. 80-20 yeah. Green Bank versus private, or the other? Private, private's 80. Green, Green Bank, Bank is 20. Green Bank is 20. Correct. But it also gave people a lot of comfort Yep. in what we were doing, because this is the first of its type on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. So that gave them a level of comfort with regards to investing in the project. Correct. And did the Green Bank also provide expertise and advice uh, in the course of what you were doing? I, I think we have a tremendous relationship with, with the gentleman that we work daily with, Rick Ross. And yes, there's a, a level of expertise there that they brought to the table because of their advanced knowledge of particularly the systems that we implement and install. And uh, they, they were like another sounding board for us, helping us make the right decisions, asking tough questions to make sure our models were, were vetted accurately. So we found a very good partner in the Green Bank on that level, absolutely. And that, in turn, is what provided Peoples, presumably, with some comfort. Correct. Absolutely. That's absolutely. Yeah. So the 80-20 was not necessarily fully reflective of the value added that you got from the Green Bank. It may have been more like 50-50 or uh, a really Im important partner. Where are you going to be located? Southington, Connecticut, where we are in the midst of construction, and we'd love to have you come out and, uh, and come take a look at it. I think Just you'd be quite give me, impressed. Give me a date. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I want to hear. <laughs> can, uh, can, can I, can I uh, we're I right know reaching the end of the hour here, but can I ask a, a question of, of Brian and Jeff and anybody else can, can fill in? Um, and, and this is just getting your help in how we message uh, this. To the extent that the case that we're making is that right now there's a little bit of reluctance from private lenders to jump into some of these newer projects um, and, and maybe a, a little bit of overpricing that happens because folks don't have experience in the, in the rate of return and consistency of return. Do we make the argument that this, that this kind of, that a green bank is something we need forever? Or do we make the argument that a green bank is a bridge to the point where this ultimately can be handled just like new home construction is, uh, is handled purely through private financing? So it's, so it's actually the latter. And let me give a couple of examples of that. So the first one is actually a transaction that we did with KeyBank. Um, it was a $60 million uh, fund. Uh, we partnered with U.S. Bank on tax equity. KeyBank was the lead in terms of underwriting the debt. Um, so we had $50 million of private capital, $10 million of state funds. Um, we uh, supported residential solar PV uh, for homeowners through a lease product, lowered their energy costs. What's interesting is what's happened through that transaction is that the debt lenders are now understanding the risks better for clean energy and are saying, you know what, we understand this technology a little bit better. Tell me a little bit more about that anaerobic digester project, that wind project, because you know these are investment opportunities for us. There was a second transaction that we did uh, with a company called SunGage Financial out of Massachusetts. This is a little uh, startup company. I think we call them a clean fintech company. Uh, they came to us and said, you know what? It's about time that there be a solar loan product for homeowners, specifically uh, for homeowners, a, a loan product. Uh, we went out to a number of institutional investors, and they said, you know what, when you have 50 to $100 million worth of transactions, come back to us, and we'll be ready to, to provide an investment. Well, you know, it takes time to build that, that portfolio. We ended up using our own balance sheet to uh, provide $6 million worth of loans. Uh, we ended up selling a $1 million of those transactions in the crowd. This was the first kind of crowd-based, like, Kickstarter online, people buying the loans. Uh, but what happened from that transaction is a credit union in Massachusetts said, you know what, we understand this asset better now. We're gonna commit to you, SunGage, $100 million of our capital. 
we want you to provide this loan not only in Connecticut, but Massachusetts, New Jersey, New York, California, Texas, Florida. And oh, by the way, offer the customer a few more options because we understand this technology. And oh, by the way, we don't need that green bank's credit enhancement anymore. Mm. So for us, that was a perfect example of how you de-risk a transaction. And it now allows us to focus in other uh, segments. But I think Chris's question was not project by project, how you divest or withdraw from those projects and you're a bridge in that project, but more broadly, in a decade, are we still gonna need green banks? And I would think we still will, that there's still gonna be an opportunity and need for that investment in the somewhat at the edge, innovative, inventive kind of project where capital may be necessary and also the cost of capital is not going to stay as low as it is right now, likely, I, who knows, but um, it may not. And so there will be a need for, for low interest. Yeah, just real quickly, and then I'll, Jeff, is we've been having conversation that the green bank model can apply to sustainability broadly. So we talk about it in terms of clean energy. It can be applied to transportation, water, waste, uh, you know, you name it. Um, we're just testing it out now in, in clean energy, but Jeff. Yeah, and I think broadly the way we've seen this operate in Connecticut and we talk about it in other states is that a green bank might, it might not need to exist forever, but the sectors that it addresses and the kinds of investments it makes can change over time. That in, you know, Connecticut Green Bank no longer has to be in the solar loan business so it can pull back its capital and then, as you said, move to the next frontier, move on to the next technology. Um, the, it, there certainly could be a point where the existence of a green bank is no longer necessary. And I think that's probably ultimately the kind of theoretical goal we want here where this is entirely private sector driven. Um, but as technologies develop and different segments of the market need to be addressed, green banks can kind of continuously redeploy its capital to the next at the next frontier of the market. I, I guess the more I think about it, the more you almost hope that it doesn't become irrelevant because you should be stimulating a virtuous cycle mm -hmm. in which you are uh, essentially providing the capital that ultimately ends up also going into R&D, which is producing the next cutting edge technology, which needs the next exactly. level of, uh, right, right, exactly, so. But it's sometimes reassuring to our colleagues to say, you know, <laughs> we won't need this after a while. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> one, maybe one, one final question. Yeah, I know. Question uh, from online uh, directed to Jeff. Someone wanted to hear how are green banks doing around the country? Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, the New York Green Bank, which was the uh, second institution set up in the country, um, has uh, now stimulated, uh, animated about uh, 500 to 600 million dollars of total investment. Uh, it's about a five to one leverage ratio. Uh, that's across residential, commercial efficiency, a number of different solar models, a distributed wind financing project, actually, which is really innovative. Um, in California, there's a, a new institution called the California Clean Center that um, has done one of the first and uh, kind of innovative LED street lighting con uh, conversions, uh, doing mil mostly municipal lending to date. Um, Rhode Island, just up the road, uh, you know, as was mentioned before, um, Senator Whitehouse is the co-sponsor. Uh, they took their clean water finance agency and converted it into the Rhode Island Infrastructure Bank to make investments in both water and clean energy as a driver of economic growth and uh, job creation in the state. And so that's been a really effective model. Um, but then uh, even at the local level, uh, we're now working in Montgomery County, Maryland, which is a county uh, just adjacent to uh, Washington DC, over a million people there. The first county level green bank in the country is just getting up and running. Um, so we have a lot of track record of success uh, over you know, nearly $2 billion of total green bank investment around the country to date so far. And we were we were recently approached by a Native American tribe who was also thinking right. about setting yeah. up a green bank. But uh, maybe a final closing remarks, and then Jeff, you want to close us on out? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, thank you again to uh, both of you for your tremendous leadership uh, on this topic. Uh, it's I think it's a Connecticut citizen should be really proud and really excited about um, their DC leadership, uh, the work of Governor Malloy, um, Commissioner Esty and Clee here. Uh, in the state uh, and their green bank. It's, it's kind of remarkable to see the kinds of leadership and progress um, and economic development that's come from the green bank model to date. Um, 
as, as was mentioned before, the national green bank conversation started actually back in 2009 with Chris Van Hollen. Uh, our organization was founded in 2009 by uh, Reed Hunt, who I believe was a classmate of Senator Blumenthal's in law school here, um, and uh, Ken Berlin, who's now the executive director of Al Gore's Climate Reality Project. Uh, and we've grown from uh, what was originally strong bipartisan support and passage on the House side of this bill originally um, to uh, have a really broad network of support around the country. And I think the term laboratory for democracy uh, has been uh, is really suitable for what's happened in the Green Bank space uh, in the intervening seven years, uh, which brings us back to uh, today and, as you said, this really unique um, moment in time at the federal level to have a conversation about clean energy investment and 21st century infrastructure as part of a national infrastructure bank uh, and national infrastructure discussion. Um, every one of the states we're working in wants this bill passed. Every one of these states says, whether we talk about climate change or not, this is about local economic development, this is about jobs, about lowering energy costs. Um, we talk with contractors, lenders, state government, consumers, everybody sees the value of this model. And so um, I think there's a really broad base of support out there from states, from local governments that recognize uh, what this bill is about. And ultimately, I think why this bill and this concept can succeed is because it's addressing the two most important things that federal investment can address, climate change and economic growth. And I think you both addressed both of the conditions around those topics really well today. I think you laid out a really clear path and argument for why uh, this concept should enjoy bipartisan support and be part of a national infrastructure conversation. Um, so I want to thank you both again for your time, uh, your really excellent comments and your support, and uh, thank everybody else here in the audience for joining us today. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, man. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Great job. Try not to take this with me.